Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, so, okay, welcome back, first of all. Um, I hope you had a good break. Uh, so let's, uh, let's see, um, let me recall from last lecture. Okay, so um, remember we had this Riemannian manifold closed. Riemannian manifold. So we kind of discussed uh, three types of uh, kernel asymptotics for this. Uh, the first one was. Uh, this eternal synthetic expansion of the form four pi t minus n over two times, oh yeah, there is this extra factor exponential minus d of x and y squared over four t, I believe, times u zero, of x y plus u one x y t one, where this um, u i um, u i are not unique. Uh, however, they are uh, the germ of u i along the diagonal is unique. Uh, so. Let me write it like this, germs of UI along the diagonal, I mean the diagonal. Nick. But, uh, <clears throat> sorry, but the, the functions are, uh, you can change it. If you move away from diagonal, any small amount, you can choose another one smoothly connecting to the first one along the diagonal. You still get the same asymptotic expansion because this is after all only an asymptotic expansion. This is not an equality, right? And this is by the way for uh, t goes to zero. Uh, the second thing we looked at was we looked at the, these functions along the diagonal, and then uh, we looked at then k of x x t. So you get a symptotic expansion, of course, four by t minus n over two. Yeah, n is dimension of the manifold, by the way. Um, Uh, and then you get uh, these functions uh, u0 xx plus u1 xxt so on. So these guys um, are uniquely defined. Our smooth functions uniquely defined. And uh, we have some information about those guys, as I said. So crucial information u zero x x is equal to one. So this is a constant function. U uh, one x x is one over six r of x, uh, or I'll just say r. But it's a function of x, of course. But let me put r of x doesn't matter. So this is a scalar curvature. I use the notation S of X, but maybe R of X is better. I mean, it doesn't matter much. Yeah. Um, so I did not give you a formula for U2, but uh, formula for U2 is not so bad. So let me give it to you. So formula for U2 is um, 
u two x x. It's a sum of five terms. Uh, it's one over eight, one hundred eighty. Rather, r a b c d r a b c d minus one over hundred eighty r a b r a b plus one over seventy two r squared minus one over 30 uh, nabla hey, I hope this is okay to yeah. nabla a nabla b oh. okay so u2 uh, as a function on the manifold they are completely well defined doesn't depend on choice of coordinates is obtained from this tensors where R A B C D is a Riemann curvature tensor. So this is Riemann curvature tensor. So once you have your G, uh, you can construct the curvature tensor, there are recipes, uh, you can construct it. And there are formulas, different approaches, they all give you the same result, more or less. So this is Riemann curvature tensor, and this is uh, contracted down, and then you're contracting this up tensor with down tensor, you get the scale here. R, uh, R, A, B is a Ricci tensor, Ricci curvature or Ricci tensor. So it's a two tensor. Again, you're contracting it like that. And this R is exactly this scalar curvature tensor. I mean, it's a scalar. R is equal to scalar curvature. It's, uh, yeah, it's, we have it here. Now, the only term I have to define is nabla A and nabla B. And this nabla A, nabla Bs are covariant derivatives uh, of operations that are defined using uh, the Riemann Christopher symbol using G. So this uh, nabla A and the other one are not same. Uh, these are covariant derivatives. Okay, so you get a scalar like this, sums of four terms. Um, uh, so this formula is, uh, it's, it's very nice formula. Uh, I mean, bear it in mind uh, if you want to understand this expansion because it gives you the nature of um, higher terms as you move on. In general, uh, all higher terms are constructed from uh, Riemann curvature tensor and its covariant derivatives using tensorial operations of contractions and uh, covariant differentiation and this sort of thing. So that at the end, you get the scalar. Uh, so one, two, three, four, again, uh, four terms. Uh, the next one, uh, it's definitely, I, I don't remember really, I wouldn't be surprised if it's in the order of 10 terms or something. Um, so yeah, anyhow, so uh, that's that's the way. Uh, so so let me write it like this, and u n x x is expressible. There are some universal polynomials uh, in terms of. So if you have this uh, covariant derivatives of these things, contractions or tensor operations gives you this. So that's um, that's something to remember. So um, I have a question. Yes, yes. Uh, what, what we what we learned um, 
uh, will we derive like uh, like the, the U0 and U1 at some point? Uh, I was planning to do it actually, but then I decided actually it's not a very good idea to, to spend time because that proof is written in many places and it's not uh, inspiring uh, that much. Uh, the proof is uh, a recursive argument and you, 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 you can just open any book uh, in references I gave you and read about that. Uh, the important thing is to understand how to use these things through specific examples uh, and um, what you can do with it. Um, I was planning to do it, but it's gonna take like three, four hours, I mean, to do a good job. Maybe I will give a sketch uh, at one stage. Huh? Or if, if there is a good um, uh, um, outline in some reference, that will also be. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. sure. I, will, I will give you uh, the reference. I mean, this um, Berger book, as I said, is excellent. Uh, you just read French a little bit, but that's fine. OK, so that's, yeah, that's a. Uh, so this is second one. And now we have the third course uh, thing, which uh, we integrate this equation over the whole manifold to uh, to obtain the next step. The next I have, quick, I have a quick question, if that's OK. Yes, yes. So these expansions exist for other differential operators as well, besides Laplacian, is that correct? Yes, that's yes. true, yeah. And uh, is there something special about Laplacian or in other differential operators, do curvature and other these these expressions appear? Yeah, the, uh, for other so in general expansions uh, exist for um, elliptic um, positive or lower bounded uh, PDEs on manifolds. Um, I believe for Laplace type operators, there are similar formulas. For example, the first thing we always know is constant. Uh, in that case, uh, the constant is going to be the rank of the vector bundle that the operator is acting on. Here we are working on a trivial vector bundle. Uh, okay. But the nature of terms uh, for Laplace type operators, it's similar to this. There, there are formulas in that case. Um, and then um, for for non-Laplace type operators, we know expansion exists, but whether it's been worked out or not, I'm not sure. That I'm not oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So, uh, and then what we do, we just uh, integrate this to get the third uh, thing. So let me just write it here. Uh, so the third step would be trace of uh, e to the minus so that will be heat trace uh, which uh, can be computed from uh, so what well, of course I mean this is just this one for the eigenvalues and that's the kernel so it's computed using this term over m volume d and then what we do, we just use uh, this expansion, term by term integrate, you get a synthetic expansion for this guy, which is four pi t uh, minus n over two times. Then I just say a zero plus a one t, a two t two, so on, right? where uh, AI, these numbers, are uh, just integral of UI xx over the whole manifold, right? Integral UI xx over the whole manifold. Okay. So, um, this is the heat trace expansion as t goes to zero. All right. So if you um, now, so at the end, then we just put these two things equal to each other. Let's see. So uh, 
Okay, so then uh, we get this expression that sum exponential of minus lambda i t is asymptotically given by that expression four pi t minus n over two uh, a zero a one t a two. Okay, and that's by the way what we called uh, ZMT, right? That was the partition function. Um, so we have this expression. So um, now, if you think about it, of course, by the information that we have about UIs, of course, A0 is the volume of the manifold. Integral one volume G over M and A one is total scalar curvature, right? Total scalar curvature. So that's equal to uh, integral R D volume G over M. And A2 uh, doesn't have a name. It's a quantity that uh, there's, there's no specific name for that term A2. Although we have a very ex explicit formula for it. Anyhow, so the, the, now what happens now, you can see that the, this, these terms are the spectral invariants, right? So that's what uh, we concluded that uh, so since left-hand side is a spectral invariant, is a spectral invariant in the sense that we have two manifolds that are isospectral, the partition functions are the same. So these expansions cannot be the same unless uh, all terms are the same. So, uh, so right-hand side are a spectral invariant. Or spectral invariants. So, uh, in other words, we just say it can be heard, so to speak. I don't know, I should put an either or not, maybe not. Can be heard. So that's, uh, that's the moral, moral of the story so far. And then we use the, but we just said the more, I mean, we just said that, okay, we can say even more because we use this tau variant theorem to prove that actually uh, Boyle's law holds for this. Not only you can hear it, you can actually, not only it's a spectral, you can actually um, compute it. I mean, um, by the following problem, e.g. Well, I mean, can be heard, I would say, um, I, I don't want to claim for all terms because it's kind of a tricky statement, honestly. I don't want to say that. Let, let's, let me just put it like this. Are spectral invariants, um, in particular, um, volume, can be heard. Volume of M and dimension of M can be heard. So I mean, to say, to go from a spectral invariant to derive a formula for, uh, you know, growth of eigenvalues, still there was a big gap and we had to use this deep, deep tau variant theorem to prove that, right? So tau variant theory uh, implied that Boyle's law. So we got the formula uh, that uh, predicted by Boyle's law that uh, n of lambda is asymptotically, there was some constant, some, uh, some constant depending on pi and n dimensional manifold, then there's omega n, 
and then there is volume of M, and then there is lambda to power M out as lambda goes to infinity. So this gave us the growth of the eigenvalues, number of eigenvalues, the standard equal to lambda. So we have this formula uh, deriving from this sort of analysis plus uh, covariance. Okay. Um, but now let's look at uh, the next term. Uh, so here's a, here's a nice example to bear in mind. Um, uh, so le let's look at surfaces. Um, uh, in that case, uh, of course, uh, we have Gauss one theorem, right? You remember. So um, for a smooth uh, oriented uh, surface, compact surface like that, um, Gauss one theorem says that one over um, two pi total um, Gauss curvature is equal to uh, the Euler characteristic of the surface which is two minus two G. So this is the Gauss curvature. So K, the Gauss curvature is half of scalar curvature. I mean, all of this. So this is a, I mean, the way that tensor analysis works in dimension two and uh, Gauss defined his curvature before all of this actually is a motivation for all of this. So he, the way he defined curvature is that curvature of a sphere of radius r uh, turned out to be uh, something like one over r squared. For radius one, sphere, I mean, yeah, sphere of radius one in r3, that's going to be one. But the scalar curvature of that sphere is two. So you have to divide by two to get one here. So that's the, that's the thing. So anyhow, um, it, it just from this analysis follows that we can hear um, the genus of a surface as well, because this is really one half. Um, I mean, if you, if you integrate it, you get integrate um, R, and that's just one half. This uh, and this a one term here, right? This is a one term. So the genus or Euler characteristic can be heard too for surfaces. So these are simple applications of um, this asymptotic expansion, right? Genus. Um, with the service. Um, is that a spectral back? So uh, spectral invariant meaning that if you have two surfaces uh, which are isospectral, they have the same genus. So that's, it's kind of one step towards the general belief that maybe iso, isospectral is actually isometric in dimension two, but um, that we'll see that uh, I don't think that's correct uh, even in dimension two. Well, we gave an example in dimension 16 so far. We haven't been able to come down yet. Any questions, by the way? Um, but at least maybe this means that isospectral implies homeomorphic in dimension two. Oh, yes. Diffeomorphic. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. Absolutely. They are diffeomorphic. Yeah. They have same genus of diffeomorphic. Yeah. But really, uh, they have the same volume. And uh, so we, we need, uh, we, we, we know a little more, but yeah, but they are so far only diffeomorphic, not, not more than that, yeah. 
All right, so any other questions or? Okay, so uh, now. Um, uh, yes, one, one small question. Yes. Uh, yes. What about uh, conformal uh, equivalence? Uh, what about it? Uh, as uh, might uh, like uh, what does what does isospectral have to say about conformal equivalence? Is there any relation? If they are isospectral, they are conformally. Um, um, so we, we, we are talking about dimension two, right? Yes. We are not talking about higher dimension because higher dimension is completely. In dimension two, uh, I believe the result that's true is that, I will mention this and maybe give idea of proof that I believe there is a result of McKean that says that uh, for each uh, kind of spectral type, there are only finite number of possibilities that could not be isometric, but isospectral. So the number of possibilities is not too many. As far as conformal goes, I'm not sure. I'm not sure one can say something about conformal, but, um, but I, I'll think about it, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, sure. So now, um, what else I want to say? Yeah, okay, now here's the question. So here, here is a very nice question uh, that um, <clears throat> we have to pay attention to. So the question is this, uh, we know that this asymptotic expansion exists. Um, so imagine you know the spectrum of your operator. Can you compute the asymptotic expansion from the spectrum? We know that it exists, right? So a question is the following, uh, assume we know all lambda i's. I mean, this is a very strong assumption, right? Because in general, we know that in very, very rare cases we can compute, but let's assume that there are some examples, as you see, we can compute this thing. So assume you have all, 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 all points, then the question is, can we compute the asymptotic expansion? I mean, in, in particular, it, we, we will be able to get a formula, I mean, to get a get a handle on volume and total scalar curvature and in case of surfaces, maybe genus and all these things. So this is the uh, question then. So we have this uh, partition function that MT, this is known, right? And we want to expand it as four pi T the power minus n over two times a zero plus a one t, a two t two. And the question is a i is of what? Um, you see, it's not a very easy question as you can see because the left hand side is sums of exponential terms, right hand side is this polynomial, I mean, power series, except for this factor. So it's kind of uh, not obvious uh, how, to, how to get AIs from this uh, lambda eyes. Um, so let me give you an example. So sort of simplest example, we always work with circle. Uh, equal to R over, uh, I, I don't know, maybe two pi z, I guess. So here, what are the lambda i's? So lambda i's are, um, uh, so the lambda i's are, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I believe so, so lambda k, 
is k squared. But we calculated this and um, they had multiplicity two, or if you just label from minus infinity to infinity, we can just label it once. And of course, zero uh, is an eigenvalue of multiplicity one. So anyhow, so this is ZMT is uh, the following function then is sum exponential of minus n squared t, right? Uh, m, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe that one. m belonging to z. Right? So this is correct, right? Because we have got uh, e to the 2 pi i kx, no, no, e to the i kx, and then at 2 pi is going to be coming back. So it's pretty out of this. Yeah, so this is the function. Uh, so in terms of theta function, you know that this is equal to our theta of t over uh, what pi. Remember this theta function uh, of theta series sum exponential of minus pi n squared t and belonging to z. So this was theta series. Anyhow, so now the question is, we know that um, this is going to be equal to uh, one over the square root of uh, four, oh, yeah, dimension is one, yeah, four pi t, right? Times a zero plus a one t, so on, right? So the question is, what are ai's, right? That's what we want to know, right? Uh, so in fact, in this case, uh, computing these AIs uh, boils down to uh, Jacobi inversion formula. So let's recall. Uh, so we did uh, something general, a trace formula, which was Poisson summation formula. And this gave us this Jacobi inversion formula. The inversion formula, I don't know, maybe yeah. I, I call it inversion formula, but uh, maybe because there is another problem called Jacobi inversion in Riemann surface theory, which is uh, not quite related to this. But so the formula is this remember, it was that theta of t for this theta function is equal to one over root t, theta of one over t. So this relates uh, theta near zero temperature, or for example, zero time, to theta at infinite time, or infinite temperature, so on. Okay, it's the other way around actually, but that's fine. So that's 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 the formula that I proved, right? So this in particular implies that theta of so can, can, can you drive now a simplicity expansion of theta from this near zero? How does it blow up near zero, this theta function? That's the question, right? Because if I know how it blows up near zero, then I know how this, uh, this guy blows up. I should just replace t by uh, four pi t, that's all. I mean. It blows up like one over a square root of t, I, I think. It's one over, uh, one over a square root of t. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. This implies that theta of t is one over asymptotically a square root of t. As t goes to zero. Why is that? I mean, that's easy to see, right? Because uh, if you have the formula, you see, um, we have one over root t, theta of um, one over t. So if you just write it, what do we get? We get, um, I mean, there is a constant there, one plus uh, exponential of minus uh, pi uh, one over t. All these terms are exponentially small near zero. So they are ne negligible. The only term that remains uh, is this one. Okay. 
Okay, so theta is one over root t, so theta of t over. Okay, so let's continue here then, see what we get. So basically what we derive so far is that all these higher terms are zero and then there is this term. So there's an MT, which is theta of T over pi, asymptotically is one over root T over pi, but that's equal to root pi over root T. Uh, so if you multiply by four and four, uh, by, uh, by what, by, by, yeah, okay. So that's equal to pi over, so I would say uh, two pi, yes. Two pi over four pi t. So this is one over square root of four pi t times, 2 pi plus 0 plus 0. Okay, so this is our A0. And of course, this is correct. This fits with what we know because I chose a circle of radius 1. Its volume is uh, 2 pi, right? It's 1 of radius 1. Okay. So, this checks uh, the formula that uh, general formula. I mean, this kind of verifies our, our general formula. But it's very good to do that. And you see, it was not easy to do it because uh, we had to, you know, do this uh, sort of Jacob. We have to use Jacobi inversion. I mean, it was a, it's a very deep result of Fourier analysis. Any questions or? Okay, so we'll go back to this theme of finding asymptotic expansion from the spectrum. Uh, but now let me, because it's, it's a good point uh, now to use this theta function identity to say a little more about nature of asymptotic expansion. <laughs> especially for manifolds with boundary. Okay. Okay, so expansion for manifolds with boundary. Again, let's uh, instead of writing general formula, uh, yeah, let me just uh, give you an example. So, simplest example again. Let's take M to be this interval of zero, one. And let's take uh, Dirichlet boundary conditions. So uh, we want a U zero. So we want the function to be vanishing at both ends. On the boundary, we want the function to vanish. U zero equal to U one equal to zero. Of course, the equation is u minus u double prime equal to lambda u, this is the eigenvalue problem. And uh, you immediately notice that general solution of this problem is ux is equal to uh, a sine of root lambda x. But this function has to vanish. This function vanish at this one has to vanish at that point. So root lambda has to be equal to um, n pi and the equal to one. So you get lambda is equal to n squared pi squared. 
So these are so now uh, the spectrum is simple. Uh, so uh, n equal to one, two, three, so on. So it's a simple spectrum. Okay, so we have the spectrum completely. Uh, notice that, as always the, is the case for manifolds with boundary, for digital boundary condition, constant function is never in the spectrum. So a spectrum, there's a gap between the first eigenvalue and zero. So it starts from some positive uh, number. In this case, it starts from pi squared. So uh, then let's see what we get for us into the expansion of the heat trace. Uh, Zm, I mean Zs1 over Zmp is some exponential minus n squared pi squared t. Uh, so what is that? That's now, now it's very important to then from one to infinity. So we want to see how does it blow up near zero. This function certainly blows up near zero, right? So we have to know how, how it does it. At what rate, for example, is it true that it's going to be uh, blowing up at the rate one over root t? Uh, for the leading term with what coefficient and then what are the next terms and so on. So in this case, again, we can write this function as uh, ZMT as uh, in terms of theta function, that's helping us. So that's equal to theta of, uh, well, this is uh, theta of um, pi t, right? Uh, uh, what was the theta function? Uh, n squared, pi n squared, right? T. Yeah, so this is theta of pi t. Minus one over two. Okay? In terms of the theta function, this is theta of pi t. Um, yeah. Okay, so now this we know that this is asymptotically given by one over root pi t. Oh, I mean, this is one over root pi t minus one. Uh, okay, so times one half. Uh, so we can write it in kind of standard form again by multiplying by root four. So this is going to be equal to um, two over root um, four by t. Um, yeah, times uh, one half minus um, just one half. Uh, so this goes away. So we have got one over again root four by t. times uh, one minus root four by t, right? One half root four by t. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, now notice that uh, in this case, uh, I got a uh, square root inside uh, this, right? So this part is the same. Of course, this is this fits with what we know. This is the volume of the manifold with boundary, volume of this one. So this term is volume of M is one. Uh, but there is this extra term now, which is the square root. And that's the that's a that's a gen, that's a general feature. So let me write it down um, for, for Dirichlet or Neumann boundary conditions, uh, the following thing holds in general. So in general, for MG, uh, 
manifold with boundary. Like with boundary. Plus uh, Dirichlet or Neumann or maybe some other types of boundary conditions. Neumann boundary condition. So you set up your, your, your spectral problem like that, you compute eigenvalues, and then you have this partition function. So uh, ZMT blows up like this. It's, uh, it's exactly like uh, before, except that you have now uh, square root and the powers of a square root terms appear. So this is going to be four pi t power minus n over two times a zero plus. Um, now we have to change the, uh, this notation plus uh, a one half t one half plus a one. So this is unfortunate, but I use it. A one half t one half plus a one t plus uh, a three over two e3 over 2 and so on. Again, so the same uh, idea works. Uh, these guys uh, uh, are all a spectral invariants. They can be obtained by integrating uh, uh, some tensorial quantities constructed out of curvature tensor and its covariant derivatives uh, on the manifold like that. So, this is um, this is a general situation for manifolds with boundary, uh, but we can but you can get even more uh, complicated terms if you deal with manifolds with uh, uh, with singularities like conical singularities, other types of singularities. I hope I uh, I, I think I will give an, an example of those manifolds with singularities later on, but. Uh, for now, uh, well, we are just looking at the smooth and the smooth with boundary. So this is not too singular, uh, the boundary term. But you do get uh, these terms. Any questions? Or? Uh, I, I am very curious about uh, what is A, A to A sub half, and does it tell us anything interesting about the boundary? Uh, A sub half, does it? Uh, actually, oh. I don't remember a general formula for a sub half, but they they are um, they are related to this. Um, for example, uh, for surfaces, they are related to geodesic curvature. I mean, so if you have, oh. you, you know, if you have like. Uh, so this is a surface with boundary. So it's related to geodesic curvature along these uh, curves, along the boundaries, those terms. So that uh, if you use uh, this result, uh, then you can drive even uh, gauss bonnet theorem uh, for, uh, for surfaces with boundary and in general gauss bonnet theorem in general. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I will, uh, I will say a little more later on, but... Uh, this is uh, yeah, that's that's a good question. Might 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 there be like if the dimension is equal to three, then maybe a sub half tells you the Euler characteristic of the boundary or something. I don't think so. I no, I, I don't think that's uh, going to be um, uh, in, in dimension above two. I think things are going to be well. Euler characteristic. Okay, so yeah, it's, you have boundaries. So Euler characteristic is still non-zero. But if there are no boundaries, odd dimensions, of course, is it. But uh, yeah, why don't you why don't you read up, uh, check it, and let me know next time. <laughs> okay, and let us uh, others also know. Yeah, um, yeah. So I think um, I did now. All right. Yeah, of course, I mean, uh, you can derive asymptotic expansion for, uh, you know, for uh, Torah in general. 
So that's not a problem. So that would be our like, I don't know, example three or four. You know, this was our old friend, flat toe, right? Again, um, uh, so this uh, Jacobi inversion, So I derived the formula uh, again from general trace formula in this case, which was this Jacobi inversion, which uh, looked like this. Um, it did look like something like this, right? Sum exponential of minus pi inner product xx t x belonging to gamma star, the dual lattice is equal to volume of, uh, I mean, gamma or volume of M basically, at T to the power of minus N over two, sum over the, um, oh, here is actually, I don't want to drop that. So this is uh, into the minus I, I use term K over T. And uh, this is K belongs to gamma star. Yeah, dual lattice. Yeah. They can write it in different form, but essentially the same thing. So this anyhow implied that ZM where M is flat torus is asymptotically again like circle or by T minus N over two. Again, there is a leading term, which is volume of M, and then there is zeros. Because those uh, extra terms, they're all infinitesimally small. I mean, they're, sorry, exponentially small. They're like exponential of minus one over T and factors. So as T goes to zero, that's exponential. Okay, that's, that's very nice. So that's what we have for, for, for tori, flat tori. And notice that, of course, flat tori, I mean, it's flat. I mean, uh, we should have something like this because all are zero, right? So, I mean, this uh, fits with this checks our general formula. Since, I mean, flat torus is flat, right? So um, M flat implies that, I mean, all, all these tensors are zero, right? So it implies that uh, our AP equal to R equal to zero and all covariant derivatives of zeros are zero. So, and, and I said, all these terms are obtained by integrating Covariant derivatives of this tensor, I mean, the tensor is zero, so everything is zero. So this should be zero. Uh, but here uh, we just uh, got it by, uh, as a result of very explicit formula, but we know that this should be the case. All right, so this fits, uh, I mean, checks what we already know. So this is some good examples to bear in mind. Uh, so this is good. Um, okay, now uh, we, I want to do an example for a sphere, which is not flat. Uh, so we expect to see now uh, higher order terms. And we want to know how to calculate those higher order terms, right? So, uh, so I will give some example, which is kind of more interesting uh, in a way. And we'll, when I come back, any, any questions or? Uh, Masoud, I just remember the question. I think it was lex lecture six. I think you were talking about this flat tori you wrote. Can you uh, speak louder, please? Yeah, sorry. So the, it is not related to this topic, but I just remembered it, it was lecture six. I think you were talking about this flat tori you wrote. 
a convolution in terms of summation of translations of a fundamental domain. Do you remember that? Yes, 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 yes. The, okay. That was the, the proof of uh, Poisson summation, yes. Yes. So over there, uh, so by definition, fundamental domains are open, right? Uh, no, I mean, fundamental domain, uh, if you want, the most general thing is any subset of, um, I mean, of, of the space uh, such that it translates, uh, generate the whole thing, and uh, the two things only intersect on the boundary. So basically, any point, if you want to take uh, open. Because um, then they would overlap those summations. But, but if they overlap on boundary, they doesn't, it doesn't matter. Right? So take, I mean, take, take a square lattice, for example, you know. Fundamental domain, you can take closed squares or you can take open squares. It doesn't matter. Just take closed squares. I mean, they overlap on the boundaries. It doesn't matter. Uh, I thought about that too, but uh, I, you will get a situation like infinity times zero. You know what I'm saying? Because the order of the lattice that you are using, I mean, yep. it, on, on paper, it is right, but I, I get the feeling that we are eliminating something I'm of measure non-zero. No, 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 we, we didn't, we didn't. No, I mean, you can, uh, yeah, the overlap is, is is okay as long as they're overlapping on set of measure zero and that's that was the case. No, I mean, go through that proof. Uh, I mean, that's very easy to see what is going on, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Not a problem. So we come back in a uh, few minutes. Okay, guys, so see you. Okay, so one more example. This is a centripetal expansion for so this is for uh, round slip. Um, so you you remember we calculated the spectrum of the round sphere. So this was new k was equal to k times k plus one. So this was the distinct eigenvalues. <clears throat> I mean, uh, k uh, goes from zero, one, two, three, but they have multiplicities. So multiplicity is UK, we derived that it was, um, I believe it was moving, uh, uh, yeah, okay, linearly to K plus one. Okay, so we have the distinct eigenvalues, the multiplicities, so we can just write down the uh, partition function. So that mt some exponential of minus lambda i t. So this is equal to now sum. Well, I mean this guy appears in multiplicity to k plus one. So this is two k plus one exponential of uh, minus k two plus k t. Okay, so now k goes from zero up to infinity. So we know that this is asymptotically of the form four pi t. Now n is two dimension of the manifold, so this becomes minus one times a zero plus a one t a two, so on. So uh, the question is, uh, what are these a i's? Right. So, of course, we know that A0 is the volume, A1 is total scalar curvature, A2 is some quantity that is not named, and uh, so on. But how? So, so now, as T goes to zero, 
So this expression, how can we write it as uh, such thing? I mean, um, it's not so clear, right? Um, so um, to find these uh, quantities, these numbers, one method is um, to use uh, uh, something called euler maclaurin summation formula. So this would be method one. This is euler maclaurin summation formula. You see, if we could turn this into some sort of theta function, then we could use those, uh, you know, asymptotic expansion near zero of theta function and Jacobi inversion and all that. But right now, I don't know how to express this in terms of theta function. So, but there is a general procedure, uh, extremely interesting to turn a sum into integral, as you know, from definition of Riemann sum, but there's a very, very precise formula to how to turn a sum into integral or integral into a sum with all the correction terms built into the formula. And this was done by Euler and McLaurin. So the formula is this, um, general for suitable functions f, so f of uh, k, k from a to b is equal to, I mean, the first order term, of course, is just integral f of x dx plus uh, first correction, next correction, I mean, is f of b plus f of a over 2. And then um, you can continue corrections as long as you want k from 2 to m, for example, dk over k factorial, and then we have got f k minus one. This is derivative of f uh, at, at m one end, and subtracting from derivative order k minus one at another end. And then there is some remainder term. There is a formula for the remainder term, uh, and then, uh, but, but I won't specify. Now, the point is that this sum can be approximated by this integral plus these terms. As uh, m grows, you can get a uh, better and better approximation. Now, but the question is what is bk, first of all? bk's um, are Bernoulli numbers. So, bk. K per Bernoulli number. So they are, so there is a generating function for this B case, which is from this function X over E to the X minus one. Yes, A equal to sum uh, BM XM over um, yeah, m factorial and from zero to infinity. Uh, you see this function is uh, analytic near zero. This function uh, is analytic because, you know, it's uh, zero over zero, it, it's clear and that's fine. So this function is nice. So there's a power series expansion. You power series expanded like that, and then you get this Bernoulli number. So that's one definition of Bernoulli numbers. These are all rational numbers. It's easy to see. And uh, the first few values are as follows. I can maybe write here. So, okay, so yeah, maybe just. So the cal calculations shows that, of course, B0 
is equal to one, P one is equal to this one, uh, P two is equal to one sixth. So you can show that. So here's a nice exercise. I encourage you to do it. Uh, I want you to show that uh, all odd uh, Bernoulli numbers are zero after the this one. Um, B to I plus one is equal to zero for all I bigger than equal to one. So the only odd coefficient which is non-zero is this P one. Otherwise, they're all zero. Okay, so do we need more? No, that's okay. Okay, so that's the generating function. Uh, these are rational numbers. Uh, okay, and then they grow, um, I believe they grow quite fast actually, um, but it's not very clear from this one, but they grow fast. They definitely grow fast. Um, Yeah, at least at the order of MPM is in the order of N factorial or something, must be something in that order. I don't remember exactly. So we are going to use this formula now to approximate uh, the partition function that we have. So apply this Euler McLaurin. to Zm, and then you get uh, the following um, expression. You get the following expression. So, well, I mean, you have to take um, A equal to zero, because we have zero, and B equal to infinity, because we have a sum from k0 to infinity, so we just get that. So we get the z uh, t is equal to z t is equal to, so z t is two, is equal to integral zero to infinity, uh, two x plus one, uh, e to the minus uh, x2 plus xt uh, dx. There is this constant that we just have in this case plus one over six, two times e to the minus x2 plus xt minus. T times two x plus one exponential of minus x two plus x t computing from zero to infinity. So when you uh, do the calculation, you get the result that. Um, Z of t. About to be one of the, I mean, this, this integral now is, of course, elementary, right? Because this is the derivative, it's a lucky situation over there. So this is equal to one over t plus half plus one over 12 times the minus two plus t. Um, so that's equal to, you can just write it as one over four pi t. Mm. Over four pi t times four pi plus four over three pi t plus So this is the, um, 
mean, even its form, of course, it should. Its form uh, confirms uh, the general form of the asymptotic expansion. This A1 is, uh, I mean, sorry, A0 is 4 pi. That's volume of this two. I mean, volume is area. What was area? 4 pi r squared, right? r is 1, yeah, this fits. And uh, the next term, uh, a1, is 4 third of pi. Well, this is total scalar curvature, integral over s2 uh, r the volume, because r is 2, right? Because now scalar is one, so that's two times. Um, oh no, no, there was a formula. There should should have been what was the formula here? I guess one third. I I made a mistake. This is should be one third. Yeah. If, even in the formulas, there was a one third. If I didn't write it, that was wrong. I think last week maybe I said one over six, but in terms of R, it's one over ten. Anyway, one third. This one. So this is uh, one third. Uh, two times uh, four pi. Does it fit? Um, I mean, we have to check that this is equal to that. This is this we have got four third of pi. Um, I'm off by a factor of two. I don't know why. Ah, of course, no, no, this is one six. What, what the no, original formula is one six. Yeah, I wrote an S, but I mean, I still meant scalar curvature, not Gauss curvature. Oh my god, okay, so that's it. So you can compute all these terms. Higher terms can be computed. So uh, I would uh, want to some exercise. Compute. Up to, uh, I would say, a ten. <laughs> Just uh, get a feeling for this. If you can derive a general formula, I believe there's a general formula. If you can derive a general formula, it would be good. Um, now the thing is, this series, I believe, is divergent for any t on the right hand side. Series. Okay, so uh, check that the series is divergent. It's divergent. Well, I mean, that's, I mean, when I said this is equal, of course, I meant asymptotic always, right? Um, that's fine. I mean, the divergent series can give the best approximation uh, of a function sometimes. This is the point of asymptotic. Now, another exercise here would be to um, do this for S3 and S4, and if you can drive uh, general SM would be good, but S3 and S4. So do it for S3 and S4 as well. Because we have formulas, yeah, I drive the spectrum completely, multiplicities. So you see a spectrum in general, it was, uh, the formula was K times K plus, so I mean, mu k, you remember, was k times k plus n minus one. So this was for Sn, right? This thing eigenvalues. And then there was a multiplicity formula for this, the genesis. So it was difference of two, um, difference of two um, binomial coefficients that I don't remember, unfortunately. But that's in your notes. Okay, so this can be extended, I'm saying, uh, in these cases using this and uh, formulas. It's kind of nice, but 
But that's only one method. Uh, there are other methods using uh, Feynman cuts formulas also. So you can use uh, some sort of Brownian motion, Feynman cuts formula to compute this. That's also nice. Um, maybe I will give this as, as some sort of part of a project to one of you. I, I will, I'm working on projects. I will send it to you soon. Um, thanks for your patience. I really appreciate your patience. Okay, any questions? Excuse me, on the right side of the board, because it's not very clear from your yeah. camera. Yeah. Uh, is there any term beside e to the minus x squared plus x times t? There is minus t times 2x plus one, okay. this one. Okay, okay. Yeah. But then you can con continue, right? That's only... I mean, you keep doing it. We just compute it, you know, yeah, yeah. Or, or up to second derivative or so, yeah. No, so, I just yeah. wanted to see if there is anything beside that because it's not very clear at the end. Oh, oh, oh yeah, sorry, yeah, let me just uh, get that. Oh, no, it, oh, yeah, yeah, That that's not good. <laughs> is it okay? Yeah, yeah, it is good now. Okay, good, yeah, very good, right. So, um, okay, so we have 10 minutes, uh, we, we just now introduce uh, some new techniques uh, and, um, okay. So one idea is uh, to introduce this spectral zeta functions. So a spectral data function. Or again, mg. So this time we define z uh, and s to be equal to sum. One over lambda i to the power s, uh, lambda i is positive. So, uh, so you should compare this with uh, Riemann zeta function, of course, which is uh, of this form, uh, the Riemann zeta function. that s was equal to sum one over n to the s, right? And from one to infinity. Uh, all right, so this one is conversion on real part of s bigger than one to start with. At least this much. From basic uh, estimates, so you know that this function is, this function zeta is holomorphic. For real part of uh, S bigger than one, because you can easily check uh, that this function is uh, uniformly, absolutely convergent on compact subsets of real part S bigger than one. And as a result of that, this function is holomorphic. So you have a nice holomorphic function there. And also for this, you know that uh, there is a pole here, no matter what. There is, uh, this function cannot be extended to one because at one, this blows up. Uh, this is converging to one over n, and this is divergent at this point, so. Now, but the question is, uh, what is the domain of S? I mean, natural domain. I mean, the first domain of this is uh, what? Well, here is where Weyl's law is, of course, good, right? And we can use it. We have Weyl's law. Basically, well, what was Weyl's law said? I mean, Weyl's law said that lambda k is growing like some constant times uh, k to the power two over n, where n is the dimension of the manifold as k goes to infinity. Okay, n is dimension of that, right? 
So this is Moore's law. Lambda k is growing of this form. Yeah, uh, it's 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 going to infinity, but at this rate, uh, and this dimension. So if you use this, I mean the basic again uh, p test or something like that. Here it, it follows. It, it implies that ZMS is holomorphic. In um, real part of S, bigger than dimension of M over two. So for for general manifolds, we have to change our domain uh, to go into uh, dimension of M over two first. And you also notice that as S approaches to dimension of uh, M over two, because of this estimate. That we have very precise estimate lambda k grows like k. So as s goes to uh, to a dimension of m over two, this becomes uh, like a harmonic series. You can compare it to the harmonic series, and then this is divergent. So certainly there is a pole. Here. I mean pole uh, in the sense that uh, the function blows up as you approach to that point from right, because we don't know anything from left. Okay, so or. So um, at least goes to infinity, right? As, I mean, <coughs> sorry, yeah. Okay. So now uh, our first goal is to see that if this function has analytic continuation to the to the complex plane or not, and um, what are the places of its uh, singularities, of its poles, what are the nature of poles, and what are the residues, and the study those. So our first goal is um, the, well, it's analytic or metamorphic extension, it doesn't matter. So uh, metamorphic, I mean, let me put it like this analytic continuation. Of uh, zeta and s to c. I mean c minus uh, some some set of singularities that we will determine exactly where the set of singularities are. Of course, the the blueprint uh, right. The blueprint here is uh, Riemann's work. I mean Riemann, uh, what he did in that uh, amazing paper. What was the size of the paper he wrote? Eight pages, something like that in uh, 1859. Uh, in the first uh, two, three pages, he gave two proof of analytic continuation and functional equation, maybe first three, four pages. He gave two proofs of, because I mean, if you look at this function, uh, there is no reason to, for this to have analytic continuation for the function. It's, it's completely uh, mysterious why this should exist. If I give you a bunch of numbers, it's even more mysterious here, right? Because these numbers are completely, I mean, just crazy. For now, the only information that we have is this. Well, we know more, but uh, the first information that we have uh, at our disposal is this. And going from here to existence of analytic continuation, I can tell you that that's not possible. I mean, if you just know that bunch of numbers, I mean, series of numbers are growing like Wiles law, certainly it's not true that uh, the function, the zeta function that you write, is holomorphic on the right-hand side. This part is easy, right? This is trivial, easy. But existence of analytic continuation to the left of this wall, <laughs> to here, it's not easy at all. It's not an obvious fact. It's, it, you, you have to you have to do something uh, very interesting in order to do that. Uh, so there is somehow information about eigenvalues. There is some extra information that's packed into these eigenvalues that you have to use it. But how? That's the that's the mystery of uh, this whole um, uh, analytic continuation of zeta function. 
function. So, okay, I think it's a good time to stop now, but um, we will do that. Um, by the way, just one more remark. Of course, uh, the Riemann zeta function is related to uh, zeta function of the circle, right? So let me just write it. I mean, uh, so yeah, I mean, okay, so uh, well, I mean, take S1 equal to our uh, circle of radius one, two pi z. Right, then uh, we got that uh, spectrum, lambda uh, k, well, yeah. What was it? Was it uh, like, um, uh, what, what did we derive for the spectrum? Lambda k was k squared, I believe, yeah. Yeah, I mean k squared. I mean, so if you just uh, form this data S1, of radius one of S, you are going to get, well, we have to throw away a zero eigenvalue, right? Because you cannot divide by zero. You just throw away zero and then we get some. Uh, and then, uh, so basically two over uh, N to the power two S, N from one to infinity, right? You get that. And you, of course, this you can see that this is equal to twice zeta of two s. Okay, so we get the, we get a relation be, between zeta function of the circle and Riemann zeta function, which is this one. So zeta s one of s is equal to twice uh, Riemann uh, go to s. Yeah, that's, uh, that's what we have, right? Yeah. Okay, so if you believe in uh, Riemann's uh, well, <laughs> should, uh, proof of analytic continuation, at least for the circle, we know that uh, analytic continuation exists. But I mean, okay, I mean, in this case, uh, this is like a half, right? Uh, because dimension of m over two is, uh, I mean, it just fits with what we know here, but of course, I mean, we know it anyhow. This two s equal to one gives us s equal to half. So it's here. This is the natural domain for this function and for this function, which is, so there is this relation. Um, but okay, but that doesn't mean that uh, we can use this to prove general analytic continuation. We have to use a, a different kind of idea. So that's what we will do next time. And uh, we will use this uh, zeta function to um, say a little more about the nature of the spectrum and all this thing. So yeah, so that's, uh, that's it. So I think I should stop the video and then I just wait for your questions. Yeah. Okay, thank you guys, yeah.